Good morning. My name is John Dutton. I'm the head of Uplink at the World Economic Forum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the press conference, Trailblazing Entrepreneurs Tackling the World's Biggest Problems. Now, Uplink is the open innovation platform of the World Economic Forum, and we're pleased to have you here with this session. I'd like to introduce quickly our panelists that we have with us. Uh, to my left, we have Olivier Schwab, Managing Director of the World Economic Forum, who will be making opening remarks for this press conference. Just to his left is Joe Ukuzoglu, the global CEO of Deloitte, welcome, and Suzanne DiBianca, the Chief Impact Officer of Salesforce, our two founding partners for Uplink. To Suzanne's left is Tatiana Malvasio, an entrepreneur from Argentina who is the co-founder and Chief Operating Officer of Kilomo, who you'll hear all about. Uh, to her left is His Excellency Minister Faisal Ali Ibrahim, the Minister for Economy and Planning of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Lindy, Lindy Wei Matlali, the CEO of Africa Teen Geeks, just to his left. And finally, Roy Gori, the CEO of Manulife. Welcome and thank you for being here. I'd like to also thank our journalists in the room and those online who are streaming. Two very quick housekeeping announcements. Um, we're thrilled to have all of you here. We would ask that you keep any questions on topic for this press conference about Uplink and invite you to engage with this audience uh, as we go through and introduce yourself if you make a question. Uh, please, Olivier, could you provide us with some, some opening remarks? Sure, thank you, John. Uh, thank you. Now, we all know we need four, five, six, seven trillion dollars per year to reach the UN SDGs goals uh, by uh, 2030. And what if, what if some of that investment went to the thousands of entrepreneurs around the world who are working on the ground on um, tackling ocean degradation, education, um, deforestation, various levels of pollution? What if we could make that happen? But these entrepreneurs do not only need investment, they also need connections. They need commercial opportunities. They need support so that they can scale their solutions for their communities. And that's what Uplink is about. And uh, I'm really pleased we launched the platform three years ago together with our partners, our founding partners, Salesforce and Deloitte. Today we have 15,000 entrepreneurs active on the platform. We already ran 45 challenges over the past two years where the entrepreneurs uh, are able to uh, present uh, their solutions. And through the 5,000 solutions which were submitted, about 300 entrepreneurs were selected and brought into our ecosystem uh, to get support from the forum, from our network of, uh, uh, of experts and uh, investors. And we obviously want to scale that. And um, today you're going to hear I think from some of the exciting uh, concrete solutions uh, and challenges which we ran on the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. Let me turn now to uh, Joe, the global CEO of Deloitte. You've been a partner with us from the very beginning, support across the world from all your offices. Can you talk to us a little bit about your vision? Why did you get involved? Sustainability has been such an important part of your agenda. Uh, but why startups and what are your ambitions for Uplink in, in the year ahead? Well, thank you for the kind invitation. It's a privilege to be a part of this conversation and uh, all of us at Deloitte are so proud to be a founding partner on Uplink with the WEF as well as Salesforce. The world is facing some pretty daunting challenges and the UN SDGs represent significant aspirations relative to actually tackling those challenges. But the answers are not all gonna come from a few people here in Davos. Right? If, if we're really gonna make headway, we have to be able to tap into the entrepreneurial spirit across all areas of the globe, the creativity of billions of people on this planet. And that's what Uplink is about. It's about creating that ecosystem, allowing for the connection of those who have passions and creativity and an entrepreneurial spirit with providers of capital, with experts to help actually facilitate the launching of these platforms. And like you shared, this is not just an aspiration or an idea. 
this is actually scaling. We have over a billion dollars that's already flowed through the platform with some incredibly tangible examples. And I'm not going to steal the thunder. You're going to hear it directly from some of the entrepreneurs themselves. And we're just getting started. When we look at the path forward, we're about to launch a challenge relative to sustainable aviation fuel through the First Movers Coalition. We're going to be really leaning in relative to goal 11 of the SDGs around urban transformation. Cities are wonderful. They're an incredibly important element of humanity achieving its full potential. But cities represent 70% of emissions. This is all about creating a sustainable path toward the cities of the future. So we're just getting started here, and we are really excited about the growing partnership and the ecosystem that we're creating. Thank you so much, Joe, for, for being a part of this and, and your leadership. Suzanne, you personally have been involved supporting us uh, working with Uplink, um, and Salesforce has been a leader in thinking about this ecopreneur revolution. You've also been a founding uh, partner of, of 1T.org, uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why is this so important for Salesforce, for you? Uh, how are we, how are we going to be scaling even further going forward? Yeah, thank you, John and, and Joe, and um, to all of our partners in this effort. As John knows, uh, this is generally my favorite group in Davos uh, to be with. It's just incredible to, and humbling to see the innovation that is happening on a global scale. And I'm incredibly proud of what you've created, um, what we've all created, but largely uh, you, John, over the last three years. Um, and for us, you know, this ecopreneur revolution is a core part of our strategy at Salesforce. And I'm so excited to celebrate the innovation and the success here this week and all the entrepreneurs and, and all that you're creating. Um, technology and, and rapid innovation, in my view, helped in some level to create uh, some of the challenges that we're facing today as it relates to the climate crisis. And I also believe that technology and innovation is the way out also. Um, for some of the challenges that we're facing around climate. Companies, uh, entrepreneurs like Restore, which is a platform that connects people and projects to scientific data and monitoring tools and provides funding um, at scale around conservation efforts is a great example of one of these entrepreneurs. Also, Silvera, uh, which is a carbon intelligence platform and they're like the Moody's rating system for carbon projects using satellite and LiDAR technology. Incredible uplink entrepreneur that we've been able to get behind. We really want to empower uh, these passionate, climate-minded entrepreneurs all around the world that are working on some of these biggest problems. And, you know, 56,000 uh, entrepreneurs really of what you have sourced um, through looking at all around um, the globe, quite frankly, for incredible innovative solutions. And, you know, we are uh, excited, Joe mentioned, about this new challenge with the First Movers Coalition and the State Department to source entrepreneurs that are working on sustainable aviation fuel. We're incredibly excited to start in my home city of San Francisco with the Urban Transformation Challenge uh, to really exciting new challenges that we'll be working on over the next couple of months. And um, I'm just really grateful for the innovation, all that I've learned through being part of Uplink and for all the other corporations and governments around the world who have joined us in this effort. So my call to action is get involved, um, provide support to these entrepreneurs uh, in the area of which you have expertise you know, please join us on this effort of which we're just starting, but it's beginning to scale in a, in a really beautiful way. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne, and, and both to you and Joe. It's wonderful to be able to announce these two new initiatives uh, in urban transformation and with the First Movers Coalition. Um, we've been able to source already, as you heard from Olivier, over 300 entrepreneurs. One of them is here with us on this panel. There's 10 of them uh, that we've invited to come to Davos for, across all the SDGs. Um, but Tatiana and Tati, as uh, you're known, um, it's a really special story uh, of how you started Kilimo. Um, two shapers, two global shapers who met in the hub in Cordoba 
And it's just such a, a pleasure to have you now share your story. Tell us about Kilimo. Uh, it is really at this intersection, and, and you were announced as one of the 10 aquapreneurs, a collaboration we have with HCL Technologies. The 10 aquapreneurs were announced yesterday uh, who are receiving support, funding, and, and aid uh, to scale their operations. But you're really at this nexus between food, water, climate change. Can you tell us about Kilomo and, uh, and what's your vision? Well, thanks, John. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here telling our story. Um, at Kilimo, we have been sailing and developing an a artificial intelligence solution for irrigation management uh, for the last seven years. But while we were trying to grow our business, uh, meanwhile we were trying to scale, we find it a bit difficult uh, for us and it demands a lot of effort. And when we see uh, agriculture um, technology adoption uh, numbers, we find them very uh, poor. Also, if we com we take in, uh, and the the information about the billions of dollars that the uh, agriculture sector received from private capital in the last ten years, these no these numbers are very low. And the problem is too big. We knew that we couldn't solve it alone. So we start conversations uh, with a lot of uh, stakeholders in the water uh, topic. Uh, we w we f were to uh, having this conversation for months and almost mo more than a year till we decided to uh, try a new approach. Um, by the hand of Microsoft and Google, along with the Bonneville Environmental Foundation, we decided to pay farmers for safe water. So this way we could grow seven times uh, in, a, in a few months in one of the most stressed basin on the world, that is the Maipo Basin uh, in Chile. Uh, we <coughs> believe that we could grow this way because we find the right incentive and we also could align the dots. We could connect farmers with a need and corporation with another need of water net zero commitments. So uh, we could grow also this model. Today we have more than 12 million of cubic meter of water saving committed in Latin America by the hand of these companies, but also Intel, Coca-Cola, and other companies that we are also going to announce in the following weeks. Um, but we also believe uh, that the water market is happening. So it's very important uh, to start designing the infrastructure uh, to become that market transparent um, also, we are very hopeful that in the UN conference in March, uh, the net zero, the water net zero topic will be on the table and we can achieve all these objectives we have. Thank, Thank you so much for your work, Tati. It's an inspiration, I think, for all of us. And you shared yesterday in one of your presentations that you've already saved to date 50 billion cubic liters of water. I know that's just a drop in the trillions that need to be saved across the agricultural space, but it is, it's inspiring for others to be able to join you on that, on that journey. And I think what's, what's so fascinating about this example, uh, Minister, is that it, it bridges this technology. It's thinking about water. It's thinking about food and agriculture. And this is one of the things that you're really passionate about introducing. Uh, would you mind, Minister, talking a little bit about your ambitions in collaborating with, with Uplink for the food ecosystem innovation? Why is this important for the kingdom? Um, and what are your ambitions? Sure, thank you, John. And I'd like to just comment on what uh, Joe said. We are facing a lot of daunting challenges, but they're also evolving very fast. COVID, uh, we worry that COVID, which we are not fully out of yet, is two-dimensional compared to the challenges that are coming about. Yesterday we heard the word polycrisis. So uh, it's very important for us to, to really continue our legacy of uh, helping uh, address uh, global challenges. And we're doing that because of this, but also uh, because we believe in innovation. 
we believe in bold innovation, and, we, and, and if you look at the transformation in Saudi Arabia under Vision 2030, you'll see that it, it is underpinned by bold innovation. We also believe in technology, and we believe in the youth. And at the intersection of all of these, uh, in Uplink, and Uplink, I think, is a prime example, we believe not only capital and policy is enough to uh, address these challenges. SDG2, Zero Hunger, and others, I think, need some direct intervention, some support, some paving the way, and, and learning from uh, uh, these innovators uh, that address uh, these challenges on these uh, platforms. Uh, we're very excited about this specific topic. We've played a big role in energy security, in the just energy transition, fighting climate change without having to go back to coal for even a little bit, uh, and also uh, the global debt issue. I think the kingdom is continuing to play that role. But the third thing that we're really focusing on is, is food security. Food security will enable people to have uh, uh, the, the energy to learn, the energy to get the education, the energy to contribute, it's a very, very basic need. And right now, three billion people are, are, uh, are, are, uh, don't have access to a healthy diet. 2.3 billion are very uh, or, or moderately food insecure. And 828 million are affected materially by hunger. So this is something that makes sense. And, and again, we believe in the in the power of the youth. We're also doing this because Saudi is a young uh, population. 60% uh, is below the age of 30, 41 below the age of 25. We're hoping that from this, there will be that uh, uh, access to innovation, mm -hmm. uh, lifelong partnerships, and, and a force for uh, good innovation and, and solving challenges. We believe there's a lot of talent in Saudi that can contribute on this uh, platform. And a small example, during the World Cup, eight players from our soccer team are under the age of 23, and they happen to beat Argentina. Congratulations on the World Cup, but, <laughs> but that shows the power of the youth when you give them the opportunity. Thank you very much, Minister. I think it's, it's so important when you think about that, the young people being able to provide them inspiration, um, the, the ability to make a difference, um, and I think that's something that, that you share uh, with our next speaker, uh, Lindiwe Metlali, the CEO of African Teen Geeks. You have a vision also of supporting young people. Um, and I wonder if you'd talk for us a, a little bit about our collaboration that we're, we're launching here. Um, and uh, why is it that you believe so much in the power of, uh, of, of STEM education to help some of those young people in marginalized communities uh, be uplifted and potentially uh, become entrepreneurs like, like Tati here? No, um, thank you so much for having me, and I'm really honoured um, also to have the opportunity, also for you to believe in what I'm, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing, especially everywhere I go, because I, I, I deal with children who are so small. People, I think that's a long-term investment. Hmm. So most people they're not that interested. But Africa Teen Geeks, we we started as um, a coding um, organisation, and we, but my vision was to really look at how do we, um, you know, get young people from disadvantaged communities who don't have the infrastructure, who don't have anything really, and, and help them to really raise their aspirations. And, and my vision was also, it's not just about the touch and go approach, that I came and I spoke to you for half a, a day and I'm assuming that your life is going to instantly change because you know I brought somebody who is innovative and powerful to come and talk to you. Investment in young people, it, it is a long-term strategy and it needs people who are willing. And coming from Africa, I remember I remember the first time I gave my, um, my TED Talks at MIT, and I was talking about an, an invention I did where we were teaching kids how to code through knitting, because obviously we struck, in, in Africa there's a lot of issues in terms of access to electricity, you know, it goes, the, the infrastructure is just not there. I mean, even with South Africa right now, we are in that crisis, that's why our president is not here, you know, so it's, it's one of those, that, but for me it was, how do you then teach kids how to code through knitting, and understanding that we all also have the issue of the skills that we don't have. So in some areas, depending on where you live, if you don't live in the city, you probably have never even met somebody who studied computer science. So you can't say you're going to depend on 
on the volunteer community. So we had to then look at how can you get grandmothers, all of us, if you grew up, we, we had our grandmother making us jerseys and sewing things for us. So it was just to get them to understand, to see that knitting and coding is literally the same. They use the same kind of loops. It's, the concept is exactly the same. Now, when you explain to the grandmother and say, you know what, as you need, you teach the girls and then we explain to you how that relates to, to computer science, but it's also because we were able to turn it exactly for them to learn how to write a Python code by, by hand. And when we're able to take them to a computer lab and we get them to type that Python code, then what happens is what they've seen. They can see, a, you know, if it's a scarf, they can see the scarf there with all the colors. And now they can see how the computers themselves can, and the grandmothers, when they see that, we then able to then deal with the issue of the lack of girls in STEM. Now getting the grandmothers who could not be able to tell them, or there's no somebody who can be that role model or that they can relate to. Now we have the grandmothers now encouraging the kids to learn to go and, and pursue STEM and pursue uh, computer science, so telling them the importance of the kids do, doing math and doing well in math and why they should do well in math. Because most of the time in, in the developing countries, the people who stop the kids from going after these STEM careers are the parents. Because like, you know, you can't go there, it's too much of a male-dominated um, industry. So for us, it was really important. So coming and working with Uplink now was, yes, we've been doing this, and how do we then teach a child um, that it comes from such a, a disadvantaged community? You teach them, then what do they do after that? And we know that talent alone is not enough. So um, most of us are here because we had talent and the social capital. We had people that who, had, who, who you were in front of people who saw your talent and they were able to support you. I am one of those people. You know, I grew up as an orphan. I was just lucky that there were so many people I would run into, some by chance, who were able to open doors and open opportunities for me. And even being part of the WEF was because Dr. Precious Mutsipe saw me. And, and I was lucky it was also that chance encounter and believed in me and nominated me for the Schwab um, Foundation. I became a Schwab awardee and now I'm able to work with Uplink. So the, the social capital is so important. And there's nothing more powerful than WEF, like in the world globally. And uh, you know, we talk a lot about uh, creating a just and equitable world. There's a lot of criticism about WEF that is too elitist, that is a talk show. But I'm, I mean, being working with them, I've seen how the, the, the willingness to be able to allow people like me to come and present ideas and be willing, even though they can't see where that can fit in, but to say, we want to find a way of making it work so that we can take that child who is brilliant, like Pal Malaki. I mean, he started Oculus the first, when he was around 16 years old, but he was in San Francisco. So he could reach out to the people who could help him. Now, think about another Palmalaki who happens to live in a country like mine, maybe somewhere, not even Johannesburg, somewhere in Pumalanga, in a tiny village where there's not even a robot, and come up with something like that. How on earth can he be, be built an Oculus? So this is about bringing them through this community, creating a community of teenage in, in, innovators that can then hopefully become the global shapers, young global leaders, and one day be partners of West and CTS. So I'm, I'm really grateful for this, and thank you for giving me the I, I think you can see why we were so excited about her vision and trying <laughs> to support, and we believe certainly in your, uh, your ability to, to work with us, work with young people. Um, w uh, in alongside ABB, you're running a hackathon to support young African STEM uh, as students, and from that, we're gonna be able to source potential ideas and solutions for Link. Uh, so thank you, Lindy Wei, for, for that, uh, the collaboration that we have. Um, Roy, it's a pleasure to welcome you as well, the CEO of Manulife, Roy Glory. Um, we're so excited to be able to look uh, and collaborate with you around the forest economy. You have, uh, in the last six months, I believe, also made a pledge to 1T.org, the forum's Trillion Tree uh, initiative. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about why you think this is so important and, um, and how y you'd like to inspire young ecopreneurs to be taking action in this yeah. space. Excellent. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. I've got to start by saying that I feel like a huge underachiever right now, <laughs> sitting on this panel with some incredible uh, leaders and a very impressive track record of uh, phenomenal passion and performance. 
Uh, and, and it does talk to the, to the honour that I have in being here, talking about the new partnership opportunity for Manulife uh, to really make a difference. And I think I would say that you know, climate change is the single largest existential threat that is facing the planet and, quite frankly, humanity. And I think we all know that the solution to that problem is not something that we can deal with in isolation. We have to work in partnership and in collaborations. And that's why I'm so excited to be working with a coalition of incredibly like-minded organizations and individuals who are really passionate about driving change. Manulife has a really proud history of its work in terms of tackling climate change. We are actually net negative in terms of our um, carbon emissions for scope one and scope two. We are the largest institutional owner of timberland in the world with 1.6 billion trees. In fact, we've planted 1.25 billion ourselves. Um, but we also know that there's so much more that needs to be done. The sad truth is that deforestation and forest degradation accounts for 15% of carbon emissions and greenhouse gases each and every year. And, and again, that's why this partnership with WEF, with Uplink and with these incredible ecopreneurs is so exciting for us because we know that solutions to this problem haven't yet been found. And we need to create a platform and the right incentives to motivate these ecopreneurs to come up with the incredible solutions that can then be scaled. And, and again, it's with great pride and humility that we enter this partnership and we feel that this is just a tremendous opportunity to make a difference and to really start to tackle this climate change agenda with a greater sense of urgency and passion. So delighted to be involved. Thank you so much, Roy. Now, Uplink was launched, as you heard, three years ago today in this room. Um, we're incredibly proud of the achievements that we've had in that time to be able to bring a concept through to reality. Uh, you heard some of the facts and figures before about its, about its impact and, and reach, but I think you hear on the panel today uh, our ambition for the future. Two of the, the initiatives are launched and live today, both with Minister Ali Ibrahim uh, on food ecosystem innovation in arid climates. It's live on our, our uh, Uplink website, uplink.weform.org, as is our forest ecosystem uh, challenge as well, uh, sustainable forestry. And we're pleased to invite you, uh, everybody that's online, please come join us. It's free and open and public, and would invite any entrepreneur out there to join us on this journey. We also heard from about three additional initiatives that we're going to be opening over the course of the year uh, with Deloitte, Salesforce, and African Teen Geeks uh, around sustainable cities to join up on the decarbonization movement around First Movers Coalition and around STEM education, inspiring African entrepreneurs from marginalized uh, communities. Um, please join me in, in thanking this group for that. We do have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, I would just remind uh, that we would ask you to keep questions on topic for uh, this press conference. And uh, we would like to invite any questions first for Roy uh, from Manulife. He will be stepping out uh, after this for a, a panel discussion that he has. So any questions first on our collaboration with Manulife uh, for Roy? Oh, uh, we see um, one in the and we see one in the front here. And is there another question? Maybe we can take at the same time. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. It's Irene Health, Copenhagen Post. Um, you are in the Trillion Tree Initiative. How many trees you already already uh, planted or saved? And uh, what's your goal within the next three to five years? How many? Yes, thank you so much for the question. And, and we do think that nature-based solutions have such a big role to helping deal with this climate change uh, problem. And that's why being part of the One Trillion Trees org initiative is, is something we're proud of. And again, as a large timberland owner, um, you know, we're proud to, to say that, A, we have 1.6 billion trees in our portfolio, but we have, to your question directly, planted 1.25 billion. Um, and that is over, over more than a decade. Um, but beyond the number of trees that we're planting, we think that another key to success is the sustainable forestation process that we actually are running through. And we know that there is significant um, exchangeability in relation to the properties that are used for construction. So for example, if you're using 
um, timber beams instead of steel beams, um, not only is the carbon um, continue to be sequestered in the property itself, but the significant um, differential between steel, plastics and other materials that are used in construction today also make for a significant difference in terms of dealing with uh, the decarbonisation of the planet. So we are going to continue to continue to uh, invest in growing our forest land and continuing to plant trees, and we'll continue to do that at a rapid pace. Thank you. Well, with that, let me uh, invite Roy, please. I know you need to make your way across uh, to the Congress Centre, so thank you, Roy. Thank you. Um, thank you and let's see if any other questions uh, for the panel before we wrap up. Um, we have one last one. Okay, I'm getting the signal in the back that we're running out of time. Um, let me join, join me, I should say, in, in thanking Olivier, Joe, Suzanne, Tati, uh, Minister, and uh, Lindy Wei for uh, your remarks today, and, and most importantly, for, for your leadership in helping us uh, bring Uplink's vision of uh, inspiring uh, entrepreneur revolution for people to planet and people and planet to life. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you, John.